We talked about the limbic system, that emotional brain, deep inside. And the limbic system experiences the world effectively, like with feelings. And then that limbic system, the amygdala and all that other stuff, is attached to the hypothalamus. Most limbic system outputs relay through the hypothalamus, which then in part acts as a neural clearinghouse for both autonomic function and emotional responses. So that's an important structure. Then. So the hypothalamus is then straight going to the pituitary gland and talks to the pituitary gland, and the pituitary gland releases all these hormone things. We talked about that in the endocrine system. So that's how the hypothalamus is, is attaching the emotion to the physical world. So that's your, your change from emotion to physical as a responses. Limbic system also interacts with the frontal cortex, creating a relationship between feelings and thoughts. This makes us consciously aware of emotional riches of our lives. Uh, but of course, it's an interplay. Emotions can override the frontal, and the frontal can bring it back. We just talked about a few things. Soothing the amygdala is an unconscious structure. So that's, uh, in some ways, goes into that situation also. And then, from there, we go into the diencephalon. And the diencephalon lies deep within the cere cerebral hemispheres. It's an egg-shaped structure, and the diencephalon is deep. The thalamus is the main structure in there, sorry. The thalamus is the main structure in there. So if you take your brain apart, you've got a brain on the table, you've got brains, right? Otherwise, get a brain out of the cabinet. Time for that, I think. Don't be shy, just don't draw. Oh yeah, please, take your brain back. This is my brain. All right, got one on the table. So then let me, since we have that little moment, let me see, there we go. Can anybody tell me what question we're on? Okay, is this the next question? Anybody look at which question we're on? Uh, no. I think it was 15. 15? Okay. Okay, so what I want you to do first, I want you to take that brain apart, take the front off, find your insula again, make sure, remember that. Where is it? Right here. Where? Right here. It's that colorful thing. It's folded in. It's like, yeah, yeah, that thing. It's like the temporal lobe grew, the temporal, the parietal lobe grew too fast and had to fold on the, themselves, and, and with, with not less space. And no, God, you always trying, huh? Take the front off or the other brain. You need the front. You can't see it if the front is not off. There you go. There you go. And it's right that that. That where, the, where the, the green thing folds in on itself. Here it's colorful. With you guys, you see green versus white. Do you all see it? Yeah. Sure. You all got it? Right here. Okay. Oh, right there. Yep. Right here. So when you did that, then you take the other thing out. Now you're holding the cerebellum in your hand. And the brainstem basically is the diencephalon on top of it. So what I'm holding is the diencephalon. Actually, this what I'm holding is the basal ganglion. Yeah, that's the basal ganglion. So the big egg-shaped thing, and beware, that is very confusing for people. The big egg-shaped thing is the basal ganglion. Uh -huh. Then next to it is also an egg-shaped thing. Smaller. That's the thalamus. Yeah, inside, right? Mm-hmm. On the inside more. 
in its white on the on the moth. The basal ganglia is brown. The other one is white. The thalamus is white. Is the thalamus the ours is all white? Egg shape. Yep. The, the one medial, the, the basal ganglia is more outside and bigger on top of it, and the thalamus is more attached to the whole thing on the inside, more medial. So I think this is actually where we're going to go with that. So um, it's um, now we're reaching deep into the brain, which gets us more in the automated processing and the unconsciousness. Reaching deep to the longitudinal fissure, which we did when we separated the brain, we reached deep into the longitudinal fissure and we separated the two brains. So we're down here. What we do is first, when we touch, when we go down, we touch, we touch the corpus callosum. Those are those fibers that, the fibers that go from side to side. Corpus callosum. Remember those? The com those those fibers, the common sure fibers that go from side to side. The stuff the guys don't have, no. Oh, yeah. See now, this one. That was the corpus callosum. Oh, okay. That, that, right? You, deep, you go deep inside, the first thing you touch is the corpus callosum. Yes, yeah. Elliot Hicks. So this is, this is the corpus callosum. That white structure right underneath this orange. I think that's well, we don't have orange. Yeah, I know, I know, but yours is just, you know, it's the same place. That's it, right? Yeah, your corpus callosum is yellow, mine's white. Oh, okay. What's your color? Is your corpus called? It's Purple? yellow. Yellow? So when we go deep, we reach somewhere else. That's a diacephalon. That's, now we get to the meat. That's an evolutionary older brain than the cerebral cortex. When you look at the growth of a brain, if you look at a salam evolution growth, this stuff grows first, evolutionarily, salamander brain. Very unconscious. We ain't thinking about none of that. It's smell. It's looking around, making sure we're surviving. Then we get into the diencephalon, and that's younger, evolutionarily speaking, than the bottom part, the brainstem. Um, but it is older than where we're thinking. So we're like in between, not thinking at all about things, unconscious, and thinking about things. And right in there in between, we have these structures, we have this one structure that's very interesting, <clears throat> It's that egg-shaped thalamus, that's the answer, okay, you know that. But it's the place where basically all sensory information, everything that comes into the brain, gets filtered through that. So everything that we feel, we touch, all that stuff, except for smell, goes through the thalamus to be processed and then sent to other brain parts wherever it needs to be sent to. So the thalamus is heck of complicated. It's a very interesting place. Um, the only reason why the smell doesn't go through that is because that's part of the evolutionary older brain. That's like the, a lot of the rodents, they live through the world by smell. So the smell is still very strong in us as a foundation and sense coming in. That's why I think aromatherapy is great. Some lavender, no problem. I'll take it any day. So there it is. That's the thalamus there. And so all the sensory go within, the thalamus information sorts the information and edits out what we don't need and pushes, sends the signals that we do need to the next brain structure. And it is the place where we can slowly start recognizing some stuff. So it's a little half conscious or a quarter conscious. Well, some people aren't conscious at all, so it's an eighth conscious. It's a little bit conscious. It's like the old internet, the dialogue. And the pictures comes in one pixel, two pixel, ten hours later. We got it. You remember that? Yeah. That's that one. So that's the thalamus. So when we when we when we when we get pricked and it hurts, the nerve has to go from a receptor, the ouchy receptor, down into the spinal cord, up the spinal cord, into the thalamus, and we gotta figure out where to go from there. The thalamus does that and then another nerve is sent right to the place where we want to feel that pain. Or not feel it, but that pain is good to feel, so you pull away, that we don't get damaged. So that's what the thalamus does. Let's see what the next question shows you. Okay, that was
Now we go right into the CFS. Let's see if we have more, more need here. Oh yeah, we did. We already talked, the thalamus, hypothalamus has two slides. Uh, at some point I'm probably gonna redo that a little bit. Uh, but it's, it's a really interesting place. We talked a lot about it. But this is basically a list of all the stuff that we can find in there. Look at that. Body temperature, some emotions, we just talked about that stuff. Autoimmune nervous system, pituitary gland, water bounds, appetite, sleep, mind over body phenomenon, and then we got rhythms in there, biological rhythms in there, sex drive and all that. All that stuff is all here, right in here in the brain. Very small little place, right here, directly above the pituitary gland. So if you, if you have the pituitary gland here, that pink thing or that orange, whatever that is, it's right above it. So as a structure, it's right here. The thalamus is this round structure, and the hypo is right here. And right here? And yep. And right above the pituitary gland. And that's the pituitary gland. And that's the pituitary gland. Okay, so that's pituitary. That's right here. And then that's the hypothalamus. And then we gotta we gotta change gear after the hypothalamus, and we gotta talk a little bit more about what we already talked about. The brain is protected by these membranes, these meninges, the dura mater, and arachno mater, and pia mater. And in there is the liquid, the cerebral spinal fluid, and that helps us to be weightless. So we're, the brain is floating like it's swimming in a pool all the time. Thank God. It also nourishes the brain. It is secreted from the blood, specialized cells, we call that the choroid plexus, and then from there it moves through internal chambers and then around the brain, which is what I also already mentioned in that subarachnoid space. Um, and the inside structures, you can see them right here. So the, the Cerebral spinal fluid gets secreted by this, yet, this red stuff. That's called the choroid plexus. And when you look on your brain, the choroid plexus is behind the thalamus where it's pink. You see the pink? The pink represents blood. So the choroid plexus is that pink little thing. Here it's the red thing that basically takes the cerebral spinal fluid out of the blood and pumps it into these horns on the side of the brain. And if you put that brain back together, I wonder, you must have wondered, why doesn't it fit? Have you ever wondered, why does it fit? I mean, I've been wondering that, and then I realized these are spaces inside the brain, in our brain, that hold the fluid. And so on here, these are these bluish colored structures. And so we got two on the side, we call those the lateral ventricles. And then as they come together in the middle, we call it the third ventricle. Right, and so, what I have here is, a, and it's somewhere in the back. I know I forgot to take it out myself. And so what I have here is a mold that they made out of the spaces. And so here you've got these two lateral ventricles. They are these over here. And then as they come together in the midline, they're right in between the thalamus. Right here in between, that's right in between the thalamus. And so they call that the third ventricle. It's all cerebral spinal fluid, nurturing the thalamus, make sure the thalamus you want happy. Could you imagine the crap it could do to us if it relays the wrong information in the wrong place? Mm -mm. So the third, th third is here. And then <clears throat> we have a little thing that goes down and right there in front of the cerebellum, <coughs> we have an, another widening and that's called the fourth ventricle. So this is down in here. We also have some pink stuff. So we also have choroid type stuff there uh, where, we, where we secrete, I don't think it's called choroid plexus, but we secrete cerebral spinal fluid there too. And then from down here, 
it squeezes out and it goes around the brain and covers the brain and makes the brain weightless. So it's bouncy, it's like in water. If it's not weightless, you see here, it will fall down and, and, and collapse. And that's, then you, that's not so fun. So we need to make sure it's back. We need to bring it back. Sometimes that can happen, some can leak, but very rare, very rare. Um, look at that, it takes 97% of the gravity of the brain away. Brain's very, very soft, plastic. So back to the question of the test, the quiz. What's this structure between the third and the fourth ventricle called? The cerebral aqueduct. It's that little thing going between the third and the fourth. That that thing going down. Huh? Did you spell it right? And we found some where I spelled it wrong. So you gotta quiz me on those things. But we'll definitely make sure we we'll look into it. And don't worry about it too heavy. Huh? Right, I know, right? I know. It's <laughs> I realized and then I had Kellen's Medullaries, I did wrong. Yeah. I, I read the second part. Okay. Is this one right here, right? Yes, it's that little sliver down there. Well and you know what I realized, Francesco, I realize it's actually good to do the quiz this way because it helps us to learn the spelling. But the pro, you know, but in, if you have a question you text me. Yeah, yeah, if you think you should have gotten it right and you didn't, you text me and I'll get back to you. Okay. And I double check my answer because I because it's happened that I did it right. Like Karen got me one. You got me on one. <laughs> now look at this pretty underlined thing. Here is everything. So you have all of the stuff connected. So you don't even have to look for it, it's just the same color. That's what you do when you don't go back to sleep at 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> obsessive. Be obsessive. A lumbar puncture is when we want to get into between the dura mater and the well, pia mater. We want to get into the subarachnoid space and get some fluid out of, it, out of there. Some cerebral spinal fluid to figure out you know, is there a problem in there? Is there a bacteria or whatever is in there? Or we can also put medicine in there. But you want to do that below L2-ish. L2, L, no, L1-2-ish. Because when you look at the spinal cord, which we're going to look at on Wednesday, I believe, it stops about here. And then below that, it's not a cord anymore. It's just, it's just nerves coming out and going down. Like... A horse's tail, all these nerves coming down. And so when you stick a needle in here, you can wiggle around the nerves and get into the space. But if you stick a needle up where the cord is, you're going to poke the cord. That's not good. Like, you know, a herniated disc pokes the cord when it's really bad. So you don't want to poke the cord if you don't have to. And this is interesting because when we are babies, the cord and the spinal column, the bone, is the same length or when we were in the growing phases originally, maybe it's still in utero, I forgot my exactness of these things, but the process is there. And then the bone grows more than the nervous system grows, and it, so it pulls that spinal cord upward, and at the end it lands up here. And the rest is just nerves coming out. Now when they do an epidural, where do they poke? Below L1 long too. And you round it so the spine is close to the side, so it opens up and you I think, I've never had it. <laughs> I'm not planning on it. I mean, it's a good trade. I mean, I, 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 yeah, I'm not going to argue with nobody about that, especially when it's about baby. I can't, you know, that's a woman's that's a woman's decision. Yeah, if you get people tell you should have baby without pain meds and you don't want it, you have to call me. It's a woman's decision, unless it's medically a reason why not, of course. From the diencephalon, we move further into the brainstem, which is considered evolutionarily at a level of a salamander. <laughs> there is a salamander in us, I guess. Most of what we find in this part of the brain is automated visceral body reactions and neural pathways connecting the brain to the spinal cord and therefore the rest of the body. The midbrain is the first of the three brainstem structure. Within it, we found 
one interesting set of nuclei. Remember what a nuclei, what nuclei are, or nucleus, are clusters of cell body deep within the uh, CNS, central nervous system. So inside the brain, clusters of cell bodies are either on the outside shell, the cortex, or inside, and when they're inside, we call them nuclei. All right, where was that? They are responsible for making us move our head when we see or hear something around us. Collectively, they're called the corpor corpora quadrigemini, the four bodies. What do we call the two bodies that deal with our visual stimulus? Superior what? Colliculi. Ah, good. Superior colliculi. I know, that's getting deep. But I like those structures because I can understand them. A lot of, I have to make sense of these. So, you know, it's all, if you do bio two, you have to study probably more stuff that is a little harder to know what is what. But here I like to make sense of it. So when we take the brainstem, here's the brainstem, and we have our diencephalon, right here, right below that level, right about from the pituitary over, is the midbrain. Okay? And then you see this is a, there's a rounding coming in the front, and that rounding, where that area is, that's mostly pathways actually going up and down, or going to the cerebellum and back and forth. And that's called the palm. The rounding. Where the rounding is, that area is the pond. Then below that is the medulla oblongata. And we're going to get to that as well. And after that is the spinal cord. And then behind this here, that's the cerebellum. The cauliflower brain. So, what I'm looking for are two structures that are right above the cerebellum in the back. You see these two dots, per, darkish? I don't know. There is one, there's two on each side of the brain. And so the ones on top, we call the superior colliculus, or colliculi, if it's both sides. And the one below, we call the inferior colliculus, or colliculi. And the ones on top, have it ever happened to you when you have something go by on the outside? You have to look at it. So if you have something in a periphery, and you can't focus in the periphery, you can just know something happened, you have to look at it. That thing made you look at it. The supercolliculus responds to reflexes that are visual stimuli that come in the periphery and make you focus on it and turn ahead. I know. You can talk to your colliculus next time it happens. The inferior colliculus has the same thing, but it's bzzz, you know that bzzz in the mm, mm, then you hit, you didn't get the mosquito, that one. That bzzz on the side, you need to look at it, that's down in here. It's the inferior colliculus that makes you do that. I know. So I thought those are really cool. Plus, isn't that a beautiful name? Quadri means four, Gemini means body. Oh no, what Gemini? Gemini means from germinal center. So I think it's from the nucleus perspective that these are nuclei, and corpora means body. There we go. One of my absolute favorites. Hint, hint. Probably. Other nuclei we find in the brain concern themselves with influencing body movements. As you can imagine, a large portion of the brain concerns itself with having us be able to move and stand on two legs move us around in the world and manipulate it in various ways. Remember that little kid learning how to walk? There's a lot of action in that situation. So the brain, when the kids start learning how to walk, their development goes way up. Because it stimulates the brain like crazy. And that's why the more you're sedentary, the more you're stupidy. We decrease the brain function by just I mean, it is, it's, it's of course, it's, for us, it's just like we move around enough anyway, so it's good to take a day off. Or like, did you ever watch the movie Eat, Pray, Love? When the Italian guy goes, you, you American. You work like crazy, and then on a weekend, you don't even get out of pajamas, you just watch TV all week long. And uh, that's, you know. But that is a place when we get into 
being able to move, our brain function does go down when we get old. So that's one reason why it's so important to keep that mobility up. And when you look at PT, physical therapy, pulse 80, it's about walking around, walking up and down the stairs, making sure. I tell my patients, all of them pose 40, get a balance pad which you can't, you can't balance on for 25 bucks and when you watch TV, just stand on that a little bit, on one leg, it's really hard to balance. And then you close your eyes and you fall over. Yeah, don't do the fall over part. No, I don't want to take the liability. Anyway. Well, we gotta practice getting older when we are not older yet, because it's not, you know, then it's fine, I think. You tell me, you guys know I haven't told That's why we can't. Okay, look, no, that is why we can see incredible brain growth once a baby learns how to walk, and on the other hand, when someone becomes better, their mental cognitive capacity declines. Stop binge watching and all the Netflix. See, now we have Netflix, it's even worse. Uh, can you name the midbrain nuclei listed that concern itself with influencing limb flexion pathways? Oh, shoot. Anybody? Red nuclei. Red nuclei. Good job. So I just wanted to get, you know, a couple pointed out. They call it the red nuclei because it stains reddish when they put it on their stain to look in a microscope to differentiate how it looks. They have to stain these things so they can point out what's what. Uh, uh, and then the substantia nigra just comes out as darkish. And so they influence motor pathways. That has to do with movement. And then the other thing that I find very interesting is, is, is the brain stem has to filter incoming visual, auditory, and other body sensory stimuli, tape, touch, temp, all that stuff, and decide if our conscious mind needs to know about it or not. So we have a lot of filtering happening. And those nuclei in that brainstem down in here, the series, keep us alert on one hand, and on the other hand, help us go take go sleep, make us unconscious. So we don't filter. Don't, stuff doesn't need to go to consciousness when we're asleep. What else the structure that I describe? The reticular formation. Exactly. And so I'm not, you know, it's not for me, this is, that's about probably it for the information, I don't think it's on the test, but it's very interesting to know about it. That's why we cover it in a quiz, so now you can scratch that out of your memory bank. Beep. Inferior to the midbrain, we f I shouldn't have said that as a teacher, huh? Never. Inferior to the midbrain, we find the palms. It is mostly filled with nerve fibers at that point called nerve tract. So inside the CNS, Nerve tracts carry information. They're basically bunches of axons, telephone cables. Uh, they connect the brain and spinal cord, but also to another part of the brain. That sort of stands by itself, almost like a mini brain, and they're referred to as the cauliflower brain. The funny thing, though, is it has more neurons than the top brain, from what I hear. So it's a big structure. A large portion of what it concerns itself with is balance and movement coordination. Did you ever get pulled over by the CHP and think it is? They test that no. thing. Me neither. <laughs> Thank God. Uh, it helps us balance on one leg so we don't fall over uh, uh, down when we trip. What do we call that part? Cerebellum. A favorite. You can see then it said, and then the pawns here, the pawns is here, the cerebellum is here. And then you've got all these different tracks going in and out. So that's why you know the cerebellum is hugely important. You have the whole palms dealing with it. It sticks out in the front. So it's got to be important. Otherwise, why would we do that? And so a lot of what happens in planning and execution, in altering with walking and not tripping. Uh-oh. But also with other stuff, with planning, with, with um, you know, when am I going to start for this test kind of planning stuff? All of that, the cerebellum is part of that. Um, if I put it in a pathway, like I, I, I often try, we get back to that uh, on spine, when we do the spinal cord, but when you want to walk, you know, we want to go somewhere, the brain on top says, hey, let's go walk over there and turn all these muscles to get there. Uh, that's my consciousness thinking, it's dark, I need light, I need to switch on. 
And then we start walking, and then the rhythm of the walking is a rhythmic motion. We don't have to think about every little detail. It's like when you drive a car, at first you have to focus, and now you're doing everything. <laughs> you want to see that accident again. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, but anyway, that's part of that automated processes that we have. And so as we start walking, the rhythm of the walk is like, oh, that's automated. The basal ganglia kicks in and says, we know about that. The basal ganglia has stored movement patterns in it. Learn how to play the piano, and then you can do the song next day. That's the basal ganglia. And then all of a sudden, you have your eyes closed maybe even, and you trip. You have some thing in that floor nobody accounted for. There's a hole. And you start being unbalanced. And all these fibers go in and say, oh, unbalanced. All these proprioceptive fibers and that's then the cerebellum that balances out real fast and can influence the movement that way. And so you got a main focus, conscious, we want to go do that, and then you've got all these helpers that come along and help unconsciously so we can execute. Um, you said the cerebellum is how you uh, take the information in, right, for tests, like that. Wait, wait, say that again? The cerebellum is like when you take the information in for tests, like... No. Able to? No, the cerebellum is more a planning place. Yes, it's an unrememberable. Yeah, yeah, I just say you're planning for making, taking a test, how you plan oh, okay. into the future, and then you coordinate all that stuff that comes with planning for something. Okay. They found now that that's, it's not just balancing, it's not just the motor output movement it helps coordinate, it also has to do with other parts of life that we didn't even know about. So which, which part is the retaining information? The, that's the hippocampus. That's the memory place. So that's more tied to the limbic system. If you think memory, go more limbic system, emotional togetherness about learning versus the um, cerebellum. I think cerebellum, we should at this point still more think motor output balancing that we don't fall. So do people have like better hippo whatever thing than others? Hippocampus? Yeah. Yeah, but the hippocampal cells, they say grow, they can be reproducing, mm -hmm. and they reproduce uh, they, they, they go more dormant when we're depressed. So I'm sure there is individual, obviously there is individuality, the neuro nervous system is very plastic, it's very mobile or f fluid, but, but we have a lot we can do to help boost what we got, make that better. I just find that interesting. It's very interesting. How the Right, right. Well, yeah, and, and then most of us are kinesthetic, heavily kinesthetic. Then you get into the, the, the way of information uptake, the difference between understanding something and mem putting it to memory. See, a photographic memory might be fine, but you, if you just regurgitate what you read on a page, I'm not sure it's useful. Depends, you know, depends. It can be. I mean, the savants are often highly skilled in one thing and completely useless in everything else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting, yeah. Well, I think if you actually go there, you know, I think we even can then go into the autistic spectrum where some brain structures are more used or more, uh, or, or less used, like, uh, um, I forgot her name, ah, the, the lady from Colorado. Um, she has, she's the one, she's in her 60s or 70s now, Temple Grennan, and they studied her heavily. She let everybody study. They made a film about her as well, which she thinks is a good film. And she does not have hardly a cerebellum. She says, they're trying to make her ski, no, no, no good. But they didn't know about it, so they tried to, and then, you know, she talks about that. And so that's also then an extreme spectrum, I think, where, where we probably go in, in similar thinking. Yeah, it's very interesting. The more we understand about it, this is very interesting. All right, then from there, we're going to go to the next structure, and hopefully we're almost done. Oh, look at that. Good job, almost done. Ah. Then we get to the connection point of the spinal cord, that's the medulla oblongata, and our beautiful name. Gotta appreciate that. Houses control centers for breathing and cardiovascular function. <clears throat> also, the decusation of pyramidal tracts is found in the medulla. It is where nerve tracts carry motor commands coming from the brain, cross to the other side of the body, before they travel down the spinal cord to innervate the skeletal muscle to make us move, or contract to make us move. So that's when the pathway from here goes, I want to move over there because it needs to turn on the light. And we start moving and the nerve travels down 
gets influenced but travels down. Right here is the front there is where it crosses over from the wrong side of the body to the other that then the right side of the, body, of the brain controls the left side of the body and the other way around. And so that crossing happens right there at the medulla oblongata. And they call those pyramidal tracts. You know, that's one that's stuck. It's like an old name that's stuck. Because we, we could call them motor output tracts, for example, because that's what they are. They come from here, prefrontal cortex, and go to the skeletal muscle. And the neurons that sit in the prefrontal cortex look apparently like upside down pyramids. And that's why they call them pyramidal tracts. So sometimes it's good to know that some of this stuff is just, you know, somebody thinking of a cartoon kind of thing. And then they make a name out of it, and we think it's all this very important stuff, but it's just it's describing how it looks. Anyway. So that's there. It is also where nerve tracks, cardiac motor commands coming from the brain cross to the blood vessels. We did that. Um, another structure found here is involved in passing information about muscle and joint stretch to the cerebellum. What is that structure? The olive. And they were just really this one. They got on the nail. It is the green thing on the side in front of the cerebellum, and it looks like an olive, and it's called an olive, huh? We don't have the colors. Well, then you got the wrong brain. But I'm not gonna use that brain for the test. I'm gonna use the brain with the colors on for the test. Okay, so there's the olive. The green is the olive. Where are the pyramids? The pyramids? I don't have the pyramids. The pyramids are indicated in the front of the brain. Yeah, when they're together, you see the pyramids. All right, so that's there. And look at that. That's the end of that. So 